M S W Media. The rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. Hey, everybody, welcome to episode 150 of Clean Up on Aisle 45. It's Wednesday, December 6th. We are five days away from Rudy's defamation trial and Trump's final testimony in the New York civil fraud trial. I am your host, Allison Gill. And I'm Pete Strzok. We've got a big show today. We have updates in Fulton County and the ongoing civil fraud trial in New York. Yeah, and we also have some updates on the GOP congressional clown car. (laughs) who are now investigating a car loan repayment. From big money, Hunter big money. Biden. Three payments totaling $4,100. <laughs> Ricky Jim Which Comer going to break it wide open. Wide open. <laughs> Which was published We're gonna get in to the, the bottom post of it. last year. Like, <laughs> right. He's going to get to the bottom of, you know, it is, it, I checked, it's an American built automobile, so he can't be in trouble for Farah. Um, I'm I'm not exactly sure what they're looking into here, but we have some updates also on Rudy's trial about to get underway. First, we need to thank our new patrons. And by the way, we are hosting an MSW Media party, I guess, a meetup for our patrons. It's going to be for patrons of Jack, Daily Beans, Clean Up on Aisle 45. It's an MSW Media event, and it's going to be in April in DC. Uh, So if you've been thinking about signing up and pledging and becoming a patron, now's a good time because you'll get uh, invited to the shindig. Now, there is a a fire marshal limit to the number of people who can fit inside this venue. So we will have to cut off RSVPs at some point, but uh, you will all be notified when those are available. And it's going to be bigger uh, than our event that we had at the Hey Adams. So we look forward to this very much to thank you all Uh, for everything that you do. And to the shout outs today, by the way, when you sign up, you also get ad free episodes, you get early episodes. Uh, You also get the bonus episode every weekend. So twice as many episodes at the $2 level. Also, uh, this weekend for our bonus, we're going to be talking about this indictment that just dropped. It's really bad, Pete. Yeah, it really is. And this guy looks as I read through the indictment today, or it's a complaint, three count complaint. The initial thing was, well, he'd failed to register as a foreign agent. But when you actually read the details, this was a State Department employee. It looks like that the Cubans recruited, it looks like, while he was young, like before he ever entered his professional life, got him to join the State Department in the 80s and sort of ran him as he moved up through the ranks. He was on the National Security Council. He became an ambassador. And what it looks like is alleged is over 40 years, the Cubans ran this agent at the highest levels of the Department of State. And my guess is the only reason he's not charged with espionage is just because the U.S. got onto it too late. You know, all his whatever classified information he might have passed Mm. is long in the past. But yeah, we got a ton to talk about. Yeah. And that's going to be the bonus uh, episode. I figured who better to speak to about this kind of stuff than you. So we'll do that. But thanks to our new patrons, Shaney Cornell. Michelle Walbrett, Alan Anderson, Andrea Ritter, Asa Ayers, and Luella Schmidt. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Seriously, you make this work. You Supporting independent media is supporting democracy. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm totally looking forward to the uh, event in April and can't wait to meet. It was amazing to meet folks at the Hay Adams. And uh, I think this will be a blast because we can just get a lot more folks. And again, it's you know our way of saying thanks to you. So looking forward to that. So having said that, let's go on up to New York. 
where the dual gag orders issued by Judge Ingeron have been reinstated by the New York Appeals Court. This is from Adam Klasfeld. A New York appellate court on Thursday reinstated the gag orders, barring Donald Trump and his lawyers from making public statements about the principal law clerk of the judge overseeing the former president's ongoing civil fraud trial. Manhattan Supreme Court Justice author Engren noted that the ruling also reinstates a separate gag order imposed on Trump's lawyers. Now, remember, he's Judge Engren is a Supreme Court justice, and in New York State system, Supreme Court is not the highest court. It's kind of the other way around. So mm-hmm. when you hear that, uh, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, quote, this is Engren, so I intend to enforce the gag orders rigorously and vigorously. And I want to make sure that counsel informs their clients of the fact that the stay was vacated, Ingram said. We're aware, Your Honor, Trump's lead attorney Christopher Kyes responded before adding, it's a tragic day for the rule of law. <laughs> when we can't attack your law clerk. <laughs> no, no, it's like any other defendant would not get away with half of the crap that Trump has been able to get up. But no, it's a sad, it's a tragic day for the rule of law. No, it's not. And I'll tell you what, I mean, it's almost like a Streisand effect, right? Like just all the attention that Trump is bringing up about these gag orders might as well not have a gag order at all because of all the attention that this principal law clerk is getting. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I I don't think it is. I mean, when we'll talk about the timing, I don't think it's going to work out for him at all because as it turns out, this is just, well, it's not going to help him. It is drawing attention, not just in New York, but these things are all cascading into each other and things he is saying, you know, in New York or in down in Georgia are getting used by Jack Smith in his federal trial up in DC. All these different judges are, I'm certain, aware of what he's doing in other areas and none of it's positive. So this isn't you know, they'll keep their, you know, facts of their jurisdiction in front of them. But none of this is helping him. He doesn't legally. care, though. No, it's he all doesn't, He it's knows he's going to lose all these cases. It's all about the fun reason. He, all about the fun. He's, he, yeah, he knows he's going to lose all these cases. He doesn't give a shit. Like, he just doesn't care. He just wants people to violently go after his p- perceived political enemies. Yeah. Yeah. So on Thursday, a four-judge panel from the state appellate court lifted the pause on the gag order's enforcement without commentary. Although Trump's broader appeal technically remains pending, former federal prosecutor Mitchell Epner noted that the unceremonious rejection of the former president's arguments suggests the gag orders are here to stay. Quote, the appellate division has lifted the stay on the gag order in the most back-of-the-hand manner possible, said Epner, who's a partner at Rottenberg Lippman Rich PC. This is typical in New York practice when the appellate division believes no serious controversy exists. So, you know, having said that, Trump has asked the New York Supreme Court for permission to appeal. Now, he wanted his appeal to be heard by Wednesday, but the court denied that, saying it must be decided by a full panel and the attorney general has time to respond. And they gave her until December 11th, which, guess what? (laughs) is the day that Donald is set to testify. So this isn't going to get decided. He is going to be living with those gag orders through his testimony. So, And that's what he wanted. He wanted the gag order lifted for his testimony so that he could call out this law clerk. Right. Yeah, during, so sad. During the testimony. So sad. So sad. Too bad. Yep. <laughs> too bad. So sad. Bye-bye. And it's, it's really important to understand this is such a narrow gag order. It's really just about the law clerk. Yep. It's not about judges, about witnesses, about prosecutors. He could say whatever he wants about anybody but this law clerk and other court staff. Even the judge. He's like, say what do you want about me. I don't care. It's totally reasonable. I mean, it is limited. It is this one person. It's like my staff. Leave my staff alone. And of the staff, you only seem to have problems with this one person. And, you know, by the way, it's not just you, but your attorneys as well. It is not... None of these things, we we talk about, you know, this framing of stifling of rights or taking away from rights. No, you're in, you know, this is a civil trial, but in in Fulton County and the federal court in D.C., you've been indicted. These are the conditions of your release. There is no taking away of your rights. This is something that to be released on bail, to be out. We're giving you your right Rather than locked up. You know, <laughs> you, you can't go buy a gun. You can't go intimidating people. But by God, that's still too darn hard to abide by, apparently. Yes. Also, the can't commit crimes part. He's, well, yeah, yes. <laughs> he's exactly. really not good at that. And, and even though he is the final witness, he, he, he'll be testifying, like you said, December 11th. Uh, Judge Angoron has set closing arguments for January 11th. 
So we aren't going to get an early Christmas, uh, but we have something to look forward to in the new year. Well, we're going to get a Rudy Christmas. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So don't, 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 <laughs> you, you're not going with empty stockings is all I'm saying. There will be something more <laughs> than a lump of coal. So we'll get to that in a second. Um, Barbara Jones, retired judge. She was the monitor assigned to babysit the Trump organization, basically because he was creating Trump organization to... Point O, like literally that's what it was called, the Trump Organization 2, and he was trying to move money around. So the judge is like, yeah, you need a monitor, a financial monitor. And she was the a special master. She's She's been used quite frequently uh, in Donald Trump cases <laughs> or things, uh, you know, with Trump associates. Uh, she was the special master to decide attorney-client privilege issues uh, after the search and seizure of tons of stuff from Rudy Giuliani, tons of stuff from... Michael Cohen, both attorneys, so it has to be a very rigorous attorney-client privilege process. Um, she was in charge of both of those, and she's the monitor here in this case. And she has an update for the court, and this story comes from the Daily Beast. A court-ordered financial auditor has caught Donald Trump quietly moving $40 million from the Trump organization into a personal bank account, seemingly so the former president could pay his whopping $29 million tax bill. What? Trump's paying taxes? Uh, Trump isn't supposed to be moving any money around without alerting Barbara Jones. That is the former federal judge in New York tasked with babysitting the Trump org for its relentless shady business practices. But on Wednesday, she notified a New York state court about some major bank transfers that were never brought to her attention by the Trumps. Jones described the way she discovered the Trump family company once again breaking the rules during an audit of its finances in recent months. In the run-up to the ongoing bank fraud trial that threatens to vaporize the real estate company and boot the Trumps from the business world, uh, Justice Arthur Angoron ordered a company to not start shifting around funds to avoid paying what's becoming an increasingly threatening massive penalty. That meant the Trumps had to notify Jones any time they moved more than $5 million out of the massive trust, except they, they didn't. Jones said she and her team recently spotted unusual activity when reviewing 10 months of bank statements from 12 separate accounts belonging to the Donald J. Trump Revocable Trust. And they found that Trump pulled about $40 million out in three cash transfers without ever notifying her. She asked about it and got answers. These transactions included a cash transfer of $29 million to Donald J. Trump, which I have confirmed was used for tax payments. That's what Barbara Jones said. But the rest apparently went to cover Trump's mounting legal costs following a searing jury verdict in May that determined he sexually assaulted E. Jean Carroll and slapped him with a $5 million penalty. So $29 million and then $5 million still isn't $40 million. Um, no, but you know, he's got the, he earlier, I'm sure, paid off the million dollars of sanctions down in Florida that he and Alina Haba managed to rack up. Uh, although they're Maybe. appealing that, right? So I think it just, when you look at most of his competent attorneys, I think are very wise to the fact that they're not going to, you know, just put it on his tab, the retainer that I'm certain. Um, and it's interesting when you, you see like the show attorneys, the Joe Tacopinas and Alina Habas, but then when you get to a lot of the things that he's doing, you have a different, I mean, Chris Kyes is in this category, but you have a, you know, Todd Blanche. They're, they're like legit attorneys when it comes to, when push comes to shove, and I'm certain he is paying those folks in advance because they're yeah. Well, smart. we know Chris Keys, Kai's Keys got three million up front before so, he would even set and foot. you can burn this sort of stuff and getting discovery of this volume, you can burn through millions of dollars in the blink of an eye in less than a year in one yeah. case, let alone four. So, uh, you know, but how do you how do you if if you're going to move more than five million dollars? Tell me, okay. So you just move 40. So is 40 more than five? Cash transfers to your personal bank account too. Yeah. Why didn't he pay the IRS directly? And Why you know, I do wonder too, like what I can see Trump, I, I, can, I can see him playing games with like payments to the IRS, that he pays it, but then they're overpayments or he takes some sort of like future write-off yeah. against past taxes. So really mm -hmm. all he's doing is sheltering this money for future tax payments uh, in order to hide liquid assets, but I, you know, I'm I'm not a CPA, I'm not a tax person, but I would hope she'd figure that out. But suddenly, for a man who paid, you know, like no taxes because he's the world's greatest businessman, all of a sudden to owe twenty nine million dollars yeah. in taxes is something I ain't after a, two years of seven fifty. Yeah, 
Yeah. And I, I mean, 750. Not yes. Right. Right. Not, not even $250, $250 short of a thousand. Yes. Yep. $750 dollarinis. Okay. We have a lot more to cover in this show, but we have to take a quick break. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. Some more new patrons to thank. Carson Corporon, Kim Haskins, Star Luna, Daisy Mae West, Lisa Dubinsky, and Carol Affleck. Thank all of you so much. We really, really appreciate your support. You are the reason that we're able to put this together. And so thank you for, for everything that you do for the show. And again, looking forward to uh, meeting you all uh, this coming April. So let's move from New York down to Fulton County. And we're learning a little bit about what Donald Trump's defense is going to look like. Now, this is from David Wickert at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, that Donald Trump will defend himself against charges that he illegally sought to overturn the 2020 election in Georgia by arguing his claims about voting fraud were, quote unquote, core political speech that's protected by the First Amendment. In a filing on Monday in Fulton County Superior Court, Trump attorney Stephen Sadow said the former president will challenge his indictment on racketeering, conspiracy, and other charges by asserting his right to political speech and expressive conduct. Judge Scott McAfee has already dismissed First Amendment challenges from two other defendants, namely Kenneth Chesbro and Sidney Powell, both who later pleaded guilty. Uh, now, Judge McAfee cited numerous court cases in ruling that he must first establish a factual record before considering such challenges. McAfee said those facts must be established at trial. On Monday's court filing, Sadow argued the judge can consider a pretrial First Amendment challenge if the facts laid out in the indictment are not disputed by the defendants. Now, to pursue such a defense, Trump presumably would have to acknowledge his voting fraud claims were false. Quote, here, the indictment's recitation of supposedly false statements and facts, undisputed solely for purposes of a First Amendment-based general demur motion to dismiss, show that the prosecution of President Trump is premised on content-based core political speech and expressive conduct protected by the First Amendment, is what Sato argued. Now, the, the interesting thing here is like, well, my defense is like, look, I'm allowed to lie about election fraud. So it, it, it's curious that, I, you know, there are two, I don't know how you square that argument with what I assume is going to be his argument in the D.C. federal trial that he believed that the election had been stolen and he believed he had a legitimate grievance. And it's a pretty bold move to go, you know, head in Fulton County and say, well, you know, this is political expression. And, you know, if I fib or lie or exaggerate, that's I, I'm allowed to do that. So I don't quite know how he's going to uh, square these. But again, like we've seen before. Uh, certainly with the we gag order motions, I am certain that Jack Smith's prosecutors are carefully watching all of the things that are going on, uh, certainly in Fulton County, uh, but also elsewhere. Well, Pete, you're not going to believe this, but uh, up there in D.C., we just covered this on the Jack podcast, uh, me and Andy. Uh, he, he filed a motion to compel Jenks, you know, Giglio, uh, Brady. And in the motion to compel, it, it appears that one of his arguments is going to be there was election interference. Um, I didn't, it wasn't my speech that made everyone at the Capitol angry. It was Russia. Russia, it was an op. They were interfering, sowing chaos on our social media platforms. It was Russia. <laughs> and the, the, it was Russia that compromised our elections, the Solar Winds hack. Um, he, and he, so he, Mr. Russia hoax is it's, blaming it's it all on Russia. It's, it's not, apparently it's not a hoax anymore. I thought he was going to go with like the, the Italian satellite and the German no. military seizing machines that, uh, no, because the DHS it, doesn't Gina act. Gina Haspel nobody. had to take a black flight into Berlin in the middle of the <laughs> night to free the servers or some, whatever that bizarre story. Well, that's that, just it, right? Nobody's got any evidence of that no. but our dhs does have evidence of the solar winds hack from russia and uh from you know other things uh, with china and then of course remember the two iranians who were posing as donald trump fans i think they uh, were plants proud boys honestly. or proud boys earth keepers or something proud yeah boys, right? something right. like that yes yes I, it, <sighs> That's his evidence that he was right to fire Chris Krebs. He was right to question the results of the elections. Jeff Clark was right to pen that letter after his 
briefing with Ratcliffe down to Georgia to say that we found irregularities. That's what he's going with. I just um, thought you should know. Yeah, that, that ship might fly with Eileen Judge Eileen Cannon, but Judge Judkin, I think, may see through uh, this nonsense. But uh, it takes time. And again, it's all about it's all about muddy everything up and just slow things sure. down. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, told, you talked about Powell and uh, Chesbro uh, who, who pled guilty. Trump's not going to get such a he's not going to get a deal. Right. Because according to Hugo Lowell, great scoop here, exclusive for Hugo at The Guardian, Trump, Meadows and Rudy, no plea for you. You aren't even on the table for a plea agreement. Fulton County prosecutors do not intend to offer plea deals to Donald Trump and two of his high level co-defendants charged in connection with their efforts to overturn the 2020 election in Georgia. The individuals seen as ineligible include Trump, his former White House chief of staff, Mark Meadows, and Trump's former lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. Aside from those three, the Fulton County District Attorney, Fonnie Willis, has opened plea talks or has left open the possibility of talks with everyone else remaining, including Clark and Eastman, in hopes that they ultimately decide to become cooperating witnesses so where, against the former where, president. Where do you fall? What odds do you think? Where, what odds would you play? <laughs> what line, what Vegas betting odds would you place on Captain Underpants having, having the wisdom to go Nothing. ahead None. and plead out. I mean, that's a real long shot. I'd say that would go off at like 250 to one. Yeah, I, I, I think he wants to be, I mean, I think he has visions of being attorney general in the next administration. Yes, I don't know that, I don't know that Trump won't give that to him, but I think his, you know, it's what Trump always does is string people along and, you know, Jeff Carter. Throw him under be, the bus. Yeah. Right, chief of staff to something or other. but Something acting, some you know, from the Putin playbook. But on, on Monday, John Eastman asked the judge to allow him to go to trial separately from Trump. And earlier than August 2024, Eastman asked uh, for the final plea deal deadline to be moved forward as well. It's in June. Uh, and he wants that moved up. Hmm. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, the court filing from Eastman reflected the apparent trepidation among a growing number of Trump allies charged in Fulton County. <laughs> there's so many that they can have a growing trepidation. Um, <laughs> there's enough of them there uh, that you can have a trend line of growing trepidation. What uh, you say it is a plethora, a sea heavy, a plethora. <laughs> yes, you have a plethora of trepidation. It's a sweater. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, he, he, they don't want to be tried alongside Trump, right? They they envision like eight, like eight will go and eight will go and Donald, but I, well, there aren't that many left. Six and six and Donald. Like they want Donald to go separate. No, nobody wants to be tried alongside him because it would be seen as detrimental to anyone other than Trump. <laughs> App appropriately so, uh, you know. In fact, yes, that would be in the the accurate inference that would be drawn by any juror sitting there <laughs> looking at this motley crew. A sweater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When do you think John Eastman will open his flower to you? <laughs> <laughs> so. With that, speaking of the Southwest and let's uh, the three amigos, let's turn our eyes to Nevada and the great Southwest. Turns out Ken Chesbro is cooperating down in Nevada. During last week's episode, we talked about how Chesbro asked for permission to travel to Nevada and Arizona to what his counsel termed, quote, speak to counsel, et cetera, unquote. And we talked about how et cetera was doing some really heavy lifting. And it turns out, yes, in fact, it was. It's much like this <laughs> apparent, it's much like the apparent trepidation. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a way to say that. But yes. Yeah, so, that's one way you can et go. Et cetera, in fact, is described from CNN. Kenneth Chesbro, a lawyer who helped orchestrate the fake electors plot across multiple states, has agreed to sit down with Nevada investigators in hopes of avoiding prosecution there. Sources familiar with the matter told CNN. And again, the way I always read this, those sources rarely end up being government sources. They almost always end up being the client or his Chesbro defense attorney sources. who were talking to CNN. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I read that as either Kenny or his attorney are chatting with uh, this great CNN reporter. Now, Chesbro's cooperation- Yeah, with and the, they maybe are like throwing up a flag to like, hey, Jack Smith, we're, we're, a, we're a cooperative type. Look at us cooperate. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's a fire sale. What? It's a fire sale. Would you like some et cetera? We got plenty of et cetera. <laughs> We've got so a lot of et cetera and trepidation. <laughs> <laughs> a plethora of et cetera. <laughs> Chesbro's cooperation with Nevada prosecutors covers his involvement in that state leading up to January 6, 2021, when pro-Trump rioters stormed the U.S. Capitol in an attempt to prevent Congress from certifying Biden's legitimate electoral victory. Uh, and I don't think he's done. I think there's, you know, as we talked about, you know, this is just Nevada and we haven't gotten, you know, I would not be surprised at all to see similar reporting coming out of Arizona or maybe even mm -hmm. Michigan. But, uh, you know, we'll have to wait and see. And DC, I'm I'm sure he's going to cooperate. He's a, he is an un unindicted co-conspirator in the in the Trump conspiracy, coup conspiracy. Uh, I'm sure he'll cooperate there, too. I mean, yep. he pled guilty. You, it's, you can't, you know, at what point are you telling all these crimes that you did and then not cooperating with one of the investigations doesn't make any sense. Right. So. And if he's not already cooperating, right? It could be, right. you know, we're assuming he's going to go and saying, hey, are you paying attention? Who knows? Maybe he cut a deal. Maybe he's like, you know, start at the top and get a deal there. And then once you know whether or not your heaviest hammer, which is going to be, well, I don't know, but I would assume. I feel like that, his lawyers would have told the press by now. Hey, yeah, unless they had some like, you know, don't, don't you dare agreement or so. Who knows? But I would, I would think again, if I'm, if I am a defendant, or if I'm that defendant's attorney, I'm going to want to get as close to a universal solution as I can. And you're not going to get all the sort of prosecutors to sit down and agree with one another what they're going to do or not do. But what you can do is go out and reach out to these various parties and say, are you interested in his cooperation? What would that look like? What are the contours? And typically, you're going to start with the worst. The, the the biggest jeopardy that you're facing because why you know why start at the bottom because if you agree to you know some misdemeanor charge and you go up to some big heavy felony and you don't get satisfaction well maybe you want to fight it so typically that negotiation is going to start from the biggest threat working its way down and in my mind for for chesbro you know it, it that's the feds right and right. if you're the feds i mean he hasn't been indicted yet by the feds that doesn't mean he hasn't been presented with an indictment or a letter, but that means he could plead the fifth in all other cases because of the threat of criminal indictment in DC, doesn't it? Yeah. And I don't know how that would work if on one hand, if you're, you know, if you're on the record and you, you know, provide a sworn statement and then you later try and take the fifth, I mean, I think you, you, you may not be able to be compelled to restate it, but you can certainly use that, you know, these, these proffer sessions that were recorded, you know, those are, those are usable. So I, I think again, yeah, and I wouldn't have recorded those if I didn't have a deal going on with the feds already. If I'm a, if I'm a good lawyer, which then if by this logic too, then makes you wonder, does Cindy Powell have a deal? Right. She's useless though. <laughs> True. I mean, you know, she could probably have some uh, good information, uh, but it would have to be corroborated by like, I, in my personal opinion, it would have to be corroborated by some competent and trustworthy witnesses or documents. Um, may, maybe you just bring her on the stand to introduce documents like you did with in New York with Ivanka and Eric and Donald, right? Like you're only here so I can introduce these documents into the, <laughs> right. into the record. Otherwise, just shut up, you know, like seriously, <laughs> stop talking. All right. We, uh, by the way, speaking of Trump trials, D Donald now wants to have his Fulton County trial in 2029. And we'll talk about that uh, after this quick break. Stick around. We'll be right back. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We have more patrons to thank. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Jacqueline Popadich, M. Lisa Colvin, Mark. The librarian is listening and remembering. Oh, wonderful. I love librarians. Dave Canaday and David Martin. Thank you so much, so much for being patrons. We really appreciate everything that you do to make this show go. And you know what, Pete, when we when we do our uh, big party in April in D.C., I'm, I'm going to try to bring our uh, produce, my, our producer, Kanai. I'm going to try nice. to see if I can get him Good. to come along. Yes, yes. As he, well. he, mm -hmm. For those of you who I mean, he is one of the people who makes all of this go behind the scenes. And so he is a, you know, a huge force to get this done and never almost gets the, uh, the credit he deserves on a day in, day out basis, along with so many other folks at uh, MSW Media. So that would be awesome. Yes, definitely. And thank you so much. Uh, more from Fulton County. Apparently, Donald Trump wants to delay the trial until 2029. 
Trump's lawyers argued Friday that if Trump wins the election, he shouldn't face trial until 2029. Saying the quiet part out loud, I believe that the Constitution's supremacy clause and his duties as president of the United States, this trial would not take place at all until after his term in office. That's Steve Sato, Trump's defense lawyer in the racketeering case. Um, on the other hand, Sato sharply protested a proposal by Fulton County prosecutors to begin trial in August of 2024, saying that it would amount to election interference. By ke- which, by the like, this election interference idea, it's an idea. It's like collusion. It's not real. It's not a term of art. You know what I mean? Like, it... it <laughs> I I don't understand. Anyway, he says it amounts to election interference uh, because he should know what election interference is. He's he's an expert Um, by keeping Trump off the campaign trail for the final months of the election. That's what they're saying. Uh, But, you know, like Judge Chutkin said during the when she was I was there in that hearing for the March 4th trial date. She's like, I don't care what you do for a living. Yeah. I mean, there are plenty of people that have like, you know, I'm a professional golfer and the Masters is coming up. Well, tough shit. Then you shouldn't have, I shouldn't swear uh, for our, <laughs> our regular weekday show. Um, then you shouldn't have committed a crime where you got indicted or an alleged crime where you got indicted for. Maybe you're running for a beauty pageant and this is going to make you look bad. Yeah, it just might. There are plenty of things that people do who are wildly inconvenienced because they have to show up for trial and it goes on. Every single day across the United States, but somehow, you know, Trump's special doesn't have to doesn't have to do what every other defendant in the United States has to do. We all suffer when he can't campaign. Hmm. Um, that's not at all true. So anyway, um, McAfee will have to undertake uh, this calculus to balance the need to advance the criminal process uh, with the likelihood that Trump will be his party's nominee in 2024. Unbelievable, but true. McAfee got no hints or gave no hints as to how he might rule on this question, but acknowledged the thorniness of the issue at one point asking prosecutors if the trial would constitute election interference if it was in the season, uh, if it was if the trial were in session during the election on Election Day. Uh, McAfee said he didn't plan to make any decision on a trial date Friday. Uh, He signaled he would likely not do so until sometime next year. So... We aren't going to get a, a trial date, but we do know Fonnie Willis has uh, asked for August 5th, 2024. Yeah, and that's still, I mean, if he sets something in January, I mean, I think that's still achievable. But there were, you know, some things coming out in McAfee's comments that I know at least some commentators listening to him were termed it, you know, him expressing some doubt or concern about whether or not the trial would occur uh, prior to the election, now, whether or not that accurately reflects his actual concern or just what, you know, a listener might have read into it. You know, the mm-hmm. fact of the matter is none of these are, you know, slam dunk, get them done for the election. So, you know, we'll see yeah. whether I'm take his time, research it well and be thoughtful about it. And, you know, you can still August is still late well, nine and, months and, away. So, I mean, and a reminder, next year is 25 days away. True. Yes. So, yes. like it just dawned on me, I should probably remind everyone I just, I feel like it's July or something. Like I feel like we're not anywhere near the end of the year, and here we are in December, National Procrastination Awareness Month, um, because that's when I finally get everything done. But yeah, it's we're twenty five days away from yeah. next year. And now, what's interesting is that you know Judge McAfee may have new things on his plate because <laughs> Trivian Cootie threatened an election or <laughs> threatened Ruby Freeman in a live Instagram rant, possibly violating. Uh, Cootie's bond conditions. She's charged alongside the other defendants in the sprawling RICO case for her participation in harassing Ruby Freeman. She, now, she doesn't name Ruby Freeman directly in her rant, but it's clear from the context that it appears that she's referring to Freeman. This is from Fox 5 in Atlanta. Cootie made the remark during an Instagram live session on November 28th, where she answered questions from the public. The incident occurred when a man apparently suggested in chat that the evidence against her was strong, leading Cootie to express anger. Now, these her comments were first reported by MidasTouch.com. She can be heard saying on the video, quote, There's a woman sitting somewhere who knows this whole thing is a lie, who knows I never did anything to her, who knows she begged me for help. There's a woman sitting somewhere who knows that I'm going to mess her whole life up when this is done. Now, 
According to prosecutors, Cootie claimed to have high-level law enforcement connections and met with former Fulton County election worker Ruby Freeman at a police precinct, bringing another co-defendant, Harrison Floyd, who's also, you know, remember why his name may sound familiar, into the conversation. Now, Cootie is accused of pressuring Freeman to falsely confess to election fraud. The threat that she made just recently on Instagram Live seems directed at Freeman, which again, if that was the case, potentially may violate her bond agreement. Now, during the live session, as a side note, could he also mention practicing her historical mugshot for two hours and requested donations for her defense? Now, that doesn't, you know, may sound like a lot, except for I'm convinced Trump probably practiced for 16. Uh, and if you remember, she's kind of got this like, you know, chin down looking up at the camera with a little elfin weird smiles on her face. It's not, if I were to practice smiling, I sure as hell would hope I would come up with a better result than uh, than her mugshot. But in any event, uh, she also seemed to refer to Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis when talking about targeting, quote, the hoe as an explanation for not posting as often on social media. Now, it's currently unclear if the DA's office will take any action. The reason you may remember Harrison Floyd's name is two weeks ago, the DA's office attempted to revoke Floyd's bond due to social media comments, but the judge determined they did not reach the level of real threats. New bond conditions were established to define acceptable social media content for Floyd after the hearing. So, uh, you know, again, whether this, ra- this, this to me is a little different. I mean, there was some ambiguity about... Judge McAfee said, look, I wasn't present when these uh, bond uh, release conditions were drafted. Social media is sort of ambiguous. What does it mean if you at somebody on social media, if you're retweeting something, is that a statement yourself? This is her saying, quote, they know I'm going to mess her whole life up when this is done. I I mean, this isn't like Mm -hmm. some retweet of, you know... (laughs) It, it's of, not a picture of, of her of Alex Jones body or something. Cam I mean, footage. it's 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 a little more direct. So again, it's we'll direct. See. It doesn't name her specifically. True, but the context because she's talking about the police station and she's talking about you know this woman knows I tried to help her. Blah blah blah. It's obvious she's talking about Ruby Freeman, but she is not specifically named or pictured uh, in the you know the live. She doesn't like hold up a photo of her or stitch in a photo of her or anything like that. So we'll see. We'll see what. Uh, but, but the other thing, too, you know, you have to take into account they've already gone through this with Harrison Floyd, like you said. So it's not like she doesn't know she's not supposed to do this. Do you know what I mean? Right. And I don't think this is something I mean, it, it, it seems legitimate enough that I don't think you're the government's at risk of angering the judge if you were to bring this and say, hey, your honor, you know, we're we really think this is this is a clear violation because, again, it's not a. The the things that were there with Floyd were, in many ways, indirect. This is truly, literally, I will I, mess your whole. I'm life going up. Yeah. to mess her whole life up when this is done, and I I just don't you know for somebody who's a critical witness about somebody who you're charged with intimidating. Come on, right. I so we'll we'll see. I, I would it seems say- open and shut, uh, but you know, given what happened with Harrison Floyd, maybe. Uh, well, first of all, she hasn't filed. Um, I as of the recording of this podcast, maybe she has will have filed by the time this podcast airs on Wednesday. Um, but she would need to file a, a motion for for revocation. But you know, you might get another situation where he says, "Well, she didn't name her," or. Uh, you know, or she's right up to the line, or we we can modify bail conditions. I think I'm I'm I I want her to. I think she should be put in jail for this, but I'm not sure she will be given what we've seen from this judge so far. Yeah, agreed. And what I also don't know is whether or not. I mean, there is there there's a difference between if you're going after a judge or a prosecutor versus going after some poor poll worker right i mean this is not the right. sort of thing where ruby freeman ran for elected office or was appointed as a judge she was a poll worker and she's also a witness so i think you know given the given what is alleged to have happened to her i would think the court might look a, a little more favorably on Ruby Freeman and the the DA's case, but we'll see. I mean, if I had to guess, yeah, and the, the DA guess, also, Fonnie Willis argued herself in the Harrison Floyd thing. She seems very um, 
very adamant about protecting these witnesses. Uh, and she seemed real pissed that people were going after Ruby Freeman, honestly. Right. right. And uh, I can't blame her. I can't say I blame her at all. So maybe we'll see another hearing like that, like you said. Um, uh, who knows? But we do have... Some uh, a very Rudy Christmas uh, coming up right after this quick break. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. We have our final batch of new patrons to thank. P.V. Robbie, Gary Schultz, David Bird, Nate Gilman, Sherry Love Pete Swearing M., and Janine, thank all of you. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, again, deeply appreciate your support, and thank you for being partners on this podcast. So, as Allison mentioned, we do have a bit of very Rudy Christmas. It's like the, the the Star Wars specials that just totally, you know, for those of you old enough to remember the one Christmas special that the original Star Wars cast did that was just horrible. It's like the Rudy Christmas special, Don Washington, D.C. So this is a uh, Rudy is about to go uh, to trial to determine damages he owes to Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss, which kicks off on December 11th, less than a week away. This reporting is from Ryan Riley at NBC. A jury trial is set to begin next week to determine how much Rudy Giuliani will have to pay to election workers he was found to be liable for defaming. This last Sunday night, a federal judge overseeing the case blasted the once-respected former New York City mayor for his repeated failure to comply with discovery obligations and his attempt to change course on what the judge termed the eve of trial. Now, in her filing on Sunday evening, the judge overseeing the lawsuit said that Giuliani has been on notice about the jury trial demand for nearly two full years. <laughs> this is from uh, U.S. District Court Judge Beryl Howell, writing, quote, Giuliani's position that the long-standing jury demand in this case was extinguished when he was found liable on plaintiff's claims by default is wrong as a matter of law. Continuing uh, <laughs> that one of Giuliani's claims, which Howell called an attempt, quote, to shift blame onto plaintiffs for any prejudice resulting from a potential conversation from a jury to a bench trial is, in the words of Judge Howell, Simply nonsense. I love Judge Hal. <laughs> so not not again. A, a late night weekend in the weekend filing. Simply nonsense is not the kind of words you want coming out uh, of a judge <laughs> as you are about to start your trial in you know a week's time. I mean, literally, this is, you know Sunday right. night, a week from Monday, the the trial begins from the time this was issued. In a filing last month, Giuliani attorney Joseph D. Sibley the fourth. Wrote that <laughs> a quote jury trial is inappropriate on the issue of damages when a court has issued a default judgment as a sanction. He's just and, making shit. Uh, uh, yes, and it, it re he requested that Howell decide damages instead of a jury. <laughs> he can he, he argues quote or just argues that Giuliani could not get a fair trial if a jury were read the court's sanctions orders. I won't call that claim ironic. Quote, the irony of this assertion must be highlighted given the many opportunities Giuliani was afforded to comply with his discovery obligations, but to no avail. And the further opportunities Giuliani was afforded to be heard on any adverse instructions to be given to the jury, but he consented to those instructions, unquote, Howell wrote. So I, do, you it, think, it, do you think he wants... A bench trial so that he can complain about not getting a fair jury trial? Or do you think he really actually wants I, I, Judge I think, Howell no. to I decide? I think he actually wants the judge. I think as hard as the judge will hit him, I do not think the judge will hit him nearly as hard as a D.C. jury is likely to. I think the yeah. prospect of, you know, the, and, and keep in mind, you know, D.C. jury Especially who lived- Especially beloved election workers. Who, loved Ruby Freeman through, and who, who lived through January 6th who lived through all the trauma to the community that day, who lived through Trump showing up and talking about what a dirty, nasty, crime-infested town it is. He goes through all of this and Rudy leading the charge, Rudy giving his own speech on the night of the 5th. And, you know, the, I, I think he honestly thinks the prospects of whatever the judgment would be from a jury is going to be a lot worse than it is uh, from the judge. Now, why he didn't, he, he's known this, as the judge pointed out, you've known this for two years, not, not two months, not 12 months, two mm -hmm. years you've known this. And you're coming in literally a week and a day before trial, <laughs> pulling a rabbit out of your butt, trying to, <laughs> you know, make magic happen. And it's, 
it, it, it's not, it, it did not, in fact, go anywhere as this attorney probably should have uh, anticipated. And it's not like it's creating some like, oh, here's a great, you know, possibility for appeal because the judge rules, you know, incorrectly. On, and no, no, she didn't. No, she didn't. You just. No. It's simply nonsense. Yeah. And the thing with Rudy, too, who it's Trump, at least, is playing to his base. Trump is playing to the, you know, having the soundbite to Hannity or whoever he wants to talk to, talking about it. He's being persecuted and muzzled and send me five dollars. Rudy, no, nobody is sending Rudy any money. The best Rudy can hope for is that Trump will occasionally take him down and maybe have another two hundred dollar plate chicken dinner at Mar-a-Lago on on <laughs> chipped, you know, tarnished Gold I'll give you twenty percent of plastic. the proceeds of the omelet bar, right? Which he, which then Trump <laughs> will skim off, you know, a fifty percent handling fee, and Rudy comes out with like a twenty seven hundred dollar check, which he will move promptly from his business to personal bank account and uh, have Barbara Jones. Joseph D. Sibley the fourth hopefully got a big, big retainer before he agreed to this because I think again, <sighs> Rudy's going to die destitute in jail. How many lawyers are suing him? I think like two or three lawyers are suing him. And one day, right. And one just sued him for $10,000. I mean, if you're suing somebody for $10,000. Yeah. And his other two attorneys withdrew from Fulton County because he owes them millions. I, I don't think they've sued him yet. Another attorney, sue, Costello, suing him for $1.5 I think. And then, and that, that's just the ones we know. And then he he also owes the IRS fifty five hundred fifty thousand dollars. He has the 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 woman who worked for him who yep. he sexually, you know, if not assaulted, at least was wildly inappropriate. Who's suing him? I, he's he's got you. You cannot. It you can't keep track of it. Yeah, it's everyone. Dominion. That's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, honestly, by the time Dominion gets to him, he's probably going to be like, I'm I'm actually flat broke now, and in jail. You know. Yeah, yeah, and in jail. And in jail. Stamp, um, stamp some more license plates. Do a double shift. Ooh, buddy. Do a double yeah, shift we'll, so we'll, you can knock I'll, on that shift. I'll send you a couple bucks a for your commissary. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll pull it out of the I'll pull it out of the ashtray of the seventy three Dodge Dart uh, that uh, Jim Jordan is investigating. <laughs> um, as you as you said once, <laughs> long so long ago, so long ago. Speaking of good old Jimbo, let's go to Congress. Um, Hunter Biden's lawyer, who is Abby Lowell, by the way, this is also Jared Kushner's lawyer, has written a letter. Well, one of them, I should say, has written a letter to Comer and the Oversight Committee. They, we got your subpoena, big, big guy, big fella. We love it. We read it. We love it. We are happy to come testify any day in December to the full committee in public. Of course, Comer doesn't like that idea because that means, one, he'd have to be there and he doesn't like working. He likes to send his staff to these depositions. And two, he wouldn't get to misrepresent the testimony like he has with every other behind closed doors interview that he has either asked for because he doesn't, like I said, he doesn't go to them. But pretty much every single closed door interview, he's he's he has obfuscated and misstated and cherry picked what was spoken about in those quotes, and he won't release the transcripts. Yeah, and it's it's so apparent that he's got nothing. I mean, the latest thing is, you know, we talked about at the beginning of the show, this, you know, the three payments totaling $4,100. So, so what? So, so Joe Biden, this is in 2018, mind you. So Joe Biden is a private citizen minding his own business. And for three months, because Hunter's trying to get his life in order, can't make his car payments, so there he are pays. three roughly $1,400. This is the Chinese plot. This is how nefarious it is. The Chinese are trying to curb. This is, this is Jim Comer's the hamster in his brain sprinting as fast as it can on the little treadmill to get this theory out. The Chinese are so sophisticated. Biden was planning on running for president. So let's route $4,000 to himself through his son's uh, truck payments. For, Do I have for, that? For $4,100. 4100 So not, that if I not, run not, for not president. Two, mind you, not $2 billion, billion with a B, not $2 billion from the Saudis. $4,100 so from I run dad for, when he's not even president. running, let alone president. <laughs> but that's Jim Comer's coup de grace. It is his aha moment. Yeah, you can't God. And this was all published, by the way, in the New York Post in 2022. 
Raskin uh, put that. He's like, guys, <laughs> you're you're pulling up old New York Post articles from 2022 and trying to make it a thing. Okay, good job, good <laughs> good sleuthing. Yeah. You couldn't even Google it before. You <laughs> and it, you know, so in, in in the sideshow of this circus. In good news, Representative George Santos has been expelled. Ha! <laughs> Go blue. <laughs> he's, My he's, already, he's already set up, as we're taping this, already set up a cameo site, and Senator John Fetterman hired him to troll Senator Menendez. It's fantastic. <laughs> he hasn't, you know, in, in, for $300 a pop, he is willing to do this. And and again, what I hate is like, uh, on the one hand, I, I agree with the let this man never be heard from again. He just is going to go to jail and let's not talk about him. But he is such a clown. He is, this This is his element and he will- It's comedy gold. It really is. Uh, but, but he is such a miserable, awful, terrible person, but you can't. I oh, mean, Saturday Night Live absolutely. riffed on it. Saturday Night Live had an amazing, go to YouTube, watch the yep. cold open. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. But uh, I, I would, I, I cannot wait until he's, he'll have a talk show. He'll, he'll have a more listen to podcast from jail than Alex Jones and Infowars does. I, I guarantee true. it just because it's. That's it's, true. But yeah, you were right. I, th I do want to say that I knew what the vote was going to be the night before from inside sources. Uh, but, but I did not change my bet. I did not change my bet. <laughs> because I have ethics. <laughs> so anyway, um, bye, 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 bye. All right. Once again, Jim's Jordan and Comer, along with Anna Luna, I'm not going to say her middle name. It's Anna Luna. They want some shit they know they can't have. In a letter to Jack Smith, they're demanding he answer some questions. Okay. So here's what she writes, or he, them, I don't know. It's seriously just signed by these three people. Dovetailing with this inquiry is the fact that you purportedly exercised complete independence in your decision to prosecute former President Trump, suggesting that no such oversight was conducted by the department prior to your initiation of the prosecution of President Trump. Of course, you did so pursuant to your appointment as special counsel by Attorney General Merrick Garland, but consistent with our concern for the lack of oversight regarding these prosecutions, that appointment is and remains constitutionally dubious. It is the same song and dance from the Mueller probe. Remember all of the motions about his appointment, all of the complaints about him not being constitutionally appointed properly. So they go on to say, on the one hand, you either had complete independence in your multiple prosecutions of the former President Trump, such that you qualify as a principal officer whose appointment must come from the president alone with the, with the advice and consent of the Senate, or in the alternative, the department exercised meaningful oversight of you as an inferior officer so as to ensure that your prosecutorial prerogatives were consistent with the admonishment of Supreme Court uh, with at the admonishment of Supreme Court referenced above. Accordingly, the committee seeks to understand your own conception of your authority as special counsel. I guess we're just too lazy to look up the definition. But anyway, they want him to come in and define his authority. It's not going to happen. This is all, this is all kayfabe, make-believe land. They ask for shit they can't have, and then they say, look, where they're not being transparent. Lather, rinse, repeat. They also want, by the way, they want to please produce all documents, all documents and communications concerning your authority to impanel a grand jury in the United States District Courts for the District of Columbia and Southern District of Florida. Also, all documents and communications concerning your authority to offer immunity pursuant to uh, Title 18 U.S. Code Section 6002 to individuals testifying before either grand jury. And finally, we want all documents and communications concerning any oversight by the DOJ regarding any of these topics, specifically including, but not limited to, all documents and communications exchanged between your office and the department concerning your decision to return an indictment on President Trump. Now, here's the thing. All of that, first of all, it, had Garland done anything differently from what special counsel, what Jack Smith wanted to do? He would, he is by law under special counsel regs has to tell Congress. So you would have heard if, the, if there was any, you know, disagreement here, you, you would have heard by now. 
Second, all this shit is will be in the report. So I, I look forward to the letter. I look forward to the letter from Jack Smith. If he if he even deigns to justify the existence of this one with a response, uh, I look forward to his letter saying, uh, no, uh, here's the special counsel regulations. Here's the authority. Uh, you can look this up. It's on the Internet, but I got it for you. Here it is. And you're going to get all this shit in the report. Uh, and if there were any things that w- would have been, you know, th- we have reporting triggers to you for certain things. So you would have heard. Have a nice day. I mean, it's ridiculous. These yeah, letters. It, it, it reminds me very much like the same, the back and forth again. It was Jordan going up with Alvin Bragg up in New York, writing the same sort of letters and demanding yeah. and Letitia James and demanding information and this and that and getting these very nice, polite, but quite curt, like, no. Here are the reasons why, here are the limitations, and you know, you'll get it when you get it, what you're entitled to. So again, this is Oh, and is, they're giving him till December fifteenth. Well, they're gonna be too busy with their impeachment inquiry to get, you know, to get around to this, which again is <laughs> God almighty. Oh, and if you do not provide meaningful response, mm-hmm. like you didn't in June or our two letters in June or our September letter. Uh, we will consider the use of compulsory process. Like, we are okay. going to give okay. you a Susan Collins furrowed brow of concern. I'm very concerned. <laughs> oh, God. Unbelievable. <laughs> it's, speaking of which, but, you know, again, whether or not they get to it, I don't know, because despite having less than zero evidence of wrongdoing, a House vote to authorize <laughs> impeachment could happen this week. This is from NBC. The House could vote to formally authorize the GOP's impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden as early as next week, which is this week, according to Republicans leaving a closed-door conference meeting focused on the issue last Friday. That's the plan, said Representative Ralph Norman, Republican of South Carolina, who told that to reporters when he was asked if the House would vote on such a measure next week. Now, House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer, Republican from Kentucky, One of three committee chairs leading the impeachment inquiry said the GOP leadership would determine the timing of the vote. Is it me or is there a drop off in learned competence between, say, James Comer on the one hand and Jamie Raskin on the other? I just, you know, and and between Jim Jordan on the one hand (laughs) and and Adam Schiff on the other. I'm just I'm just thinking there might there might be a slight delta in knowledge of the law, (laughs) practice of the law. Knowledge of actually sense. doing your job as a guy, it, it, it just, it, it, it is, when you compare them that way, it, it just makes the difference all the more stark. Um, mm-hmm. So Comer said, the sooner the better, adding that the Republicans' time at home over Thanksgiving helped solidify support within their conference to officially authorize the inquiry. Quote, I think our conference went home last week and they heard from people at Walmart. People on Main Street who are like, find out the truth about Joe Biden's knowledge and involvement in his family shady business, he told right. reporters. Things that, that, that never happened for yes, the forty two hundred. I want to know the forty two hundred dollars. How much? What? What? What was? What were the options on that truck? And the, yeah, what was the truck package? Was it? Did it have a lift kit? Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, we. I want to know. We want to know. Get to the bottom mm. of this. Get to find out the truth. Well, we're going to get mm-hmm. to that. Now, <laughs> House leadership has not commented on how soon a vote could take place. It's not even clear the Republicans have the votes to succeed, particularly after their margin for error was cut from four to three votes, <laughs> thanks to Friday's expulsion of former Representative George Santos. So we're, we're, we're dwindling down. And now in my mind, it's only a question of like, you know, I don't know they're quite at the uh, head of lettuce countdown clock with Mike Johnson and... Uh, the head of lettuce, but we're getting close because just Mike Johnson, who just a few weeks ago said there wasn't enough evidence to open an inquiry, now says he believes he has the votes. Well, they can't so, count. Uh, uh, he, the he, he cannot. Last few I, votes are uh, any indicator. Not at but, all. Um, I don't know. This is just insanity. Insanity. He's a party whip. I mean, like, does he even. I don't know. Can he count? Like, I. Does he just divide everything by zero and it's all imaginary? <laughs> I don't know. 
No, I don't think. I mean, and that's the, you know, the biggest thing is like when it, you know, he's, he's the most acceptable MAGA person out there. But when it comes to things like counting and whipping votes, when it comes to fundraising, you know, things that Kevin McCarthy, whatever you think of him, could do both. That's not necessarily uh, true. Not a strong suit. No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. All right, everybody. That is our show, our 150th. Congratulations on 150, my friend. Um, reaching this uh, this milestone. Um, I've been uh, very happy to have you on board here. Uh, yeah, it's and, been amazing. Uh, it's been amazing. Yeah, it's been really, really great. And I look forward to hanging out with all the patrons in April in DC. And if you want to join the ranks uh, of supercasters and patrons, you can do so on Supercast by searching for Cleanup on All 45 or come on over to patreon.com slash aisle 45 pod. That's A I S L E 4 5 P O D. Look forward to seeing you. Yeah, can't wait. And we will get plenty to go between now and then. And so I will uh, hopefully this You're time next week. You're going to some of those uh, trials. Uh, have some, yeah, have gonna... some information about Rudy. I don't, we'll see how the how it breaks out with jury selection. So if not the next episode, the 152nd, have some updates <laughs> about Rudy's demeanor in the DC Bring courthouse. Bring a pad and pen because you cannot use your phone. <laughs> in a way, even Rudy has no guapo way. to face. Everyone. <laughs> Everyone has their own El Guapo. Right. <laughs> For some, their El Guapo is <laughs> wants to kill them. For us, El Guapo is a big, a dangerous man who wants man to kill us. Wants to kill them. <laughs> uh, who's our El Guapo is the actual El Guapo. <laughs> now I'm going to go watch that. All right, everybody, thank you so much. I've been Allison Gill, and I'm Pete Struck. We'll see you next week. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is written, researched, and produced by Allison Gill with editing by Molly Hockey. Our art and logo designer by Joelle Reeder and Moxie Design Studios, and our music is composed and performed by Adam Orr. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. <laughs>